So today we're going to start reading part two of Chains by Laurie House Anderson. We're going to start with chapter 25. Sunday, July 21st to Tuesday, August 20th, 1776. Melancholy held me hostage, and the bees built a hive of sadness in my soul. Dark honey filled up inside me, drowning my thoughts and making it hard to move my eyes and hands. I worked as a puppet, trained to scrub and carry, curtsy and nod. Madam would not look at me. When she had an order to give me, it went through Becky, even if we all stood in the same room. Tell the girl the hearth needs sweeping. Sal, Becky would say, please sweep the hearth. Tell the girl to fetch my fan. Sal, Becky would say, please fetch Madam's ivory fan. The library needs dusting. Tell the girl. Sal, I swept the hearth and fetched the fan. I dusted the library without looking at the books on the shelves or the horse on the wall. I preferred the chores that took me out of the kitchen, for it was there that the bees tricked me into seeing Ruth's ghost playing on the floor, churning butter or counting out kernels of corn. When her voice whispered to me, I caught fire again, from my toes to my face, and I burned slow, like damp wood. Becky watched me careful when I turned inside myself like that. She once tried to apologize for what had happened. The instant she stopped talking, I forgot what she said. The girl tell the girl tell the girl there are bedbugs in my chamber. Tell the girl to wash the steps. Curzon came round day after day and talked to me through the boards of the fence. I did not answer him. July marched out and August sailed in in suffocating tide. British ships continued to land at Staten Island, hundreds of them carrying thousands of soldiers armed with countless guns and bullets. We went two weeks without rain. There were outbreaks of camp fever, smallpox and dysentery among the rebel troops. They turned King's College into a hospital to care for thousands of sick men. I prayed that Colonel Reagan was there. I prayed that he would fall ill and die a terrible death for lying to me and betraying me and letting me them break my body. And whenever I heard the words liberty or freedom, I wanted to spit in the dust. The air was steeped with evil during those smug, muggy, pestilent days. Tell the girl to sweep the cellar. When I swept it, I found the cobwebs I had saved for Ruth. I threw them into the kitchen fire along with the mouse carcasses and rotten potatoes. Tell the girl the milk has soured was left in the sun on purpose. The British finally made a move towards the end of August, rowing half their army across to the Long Island in flat bottom boats. Becky convinced Madame to send me to the market on my own again because she was afraid to go, what with battles due to break out any minute. Madame agreed. She said my mark would ensure that I stayed out of trouble. And as commanded, I purchased two packets of straight pins, a piece of lace, and a basket of turnip greens. The shopkeepers and other folks looked at my face and saw only the angry red scar just starting to fade at the edges. They did not see the girl hidden behind it. Curzon approached me on Pearl Street and tried to talk. I walked away from him and I carried the purchases back to Madame's house, wings abuzz in my ears. Hours later, as I ate my dinner of greens and cornbread with molasses, Becky entered the kitchen with a scowl. That Curzon boy, the one with the hat, he's in front of the house again, she said. You must tell him to leave. I lifted my eyes from my plate. Why? Because Madam wants him arrested and I don't want trouble. That's why, Becky snapped. I did not move. Do you want his beating on your conscience, she continued. I chewed the last of the cornbread, then wiped my fingers and stood up. Tell him to stay away, she said as I set my plate in the washing tub. Blasted fool doesn't know what's good for him. When I lifted the latch of the garden gate, Curzon appeared mouth a fapling. Finally, we have so much to talk about. Go away, I said. He glanced up and down the empty street. Look, I'm sorry, the Colonel. I thought for sure he would help. He snapped and leaned close to my face. You don't look right, Camp. Camp fever? My tongue felt the ragged edge of a broken tooth. I'm fine. He dropped his eyes to the ground. Sorry's not enough, but I am sorry about all of it. I picked up a splinter of wood on the gate, and there was something changed about him, but I couldn't figure it out. Many things look different since they burned me up. Not your concern, I said. "'Tis so, he said. I've asked about your sister. A sailor now thinks she was put on a ship to Halifax. No, this sent her to Nevis. He opened his mouth, but could not find any words. Go away, I said, or they'll arrest you, Madam said. Has she received any letters from Lockton? The question hit me like a bucket of cold water. You're asking me to spy again? Listen, he started, our freedom. I did not let him continue. You're blind. They don't want us free. They just want liberty from themselves. Oh, you don't understand. Oh, no, I understand right good, I countered. I shouldn't have believed your rebel lies. I should have taken Ruth and I should have run the night that we landed. Even if we drowned, we would have at least been together. He reached out and grabbed my arm. Don't say that. 
His hand was strong, but so was mine. I grabbed his thumb and I twisted it backwards. Turn me loose. My body and voice shook as it trapped in one of Ruth's fits. Sorry, he released me and I released him. I'm sorry for your sister and your face and your broken head. He wiggled his thumb, a hundred times as sorry as the hills. I moved to shut the gate in his face. He held it open. We all have scars, Isabel. I'll never talk to you again. I threw myself against the gate, shut it, and threw home the latch. So in this chapter, you can see Isabel is back with Miss Lockton, and she's pretty much broken. They, she is a strong character. We've seen that throughout the story, how she, uh, she fights for freedom, she fights for Ruth, but it's almost like now the wind's been knocked out of her, and she just doesn't even have any fight left in her. The bees are buzzing in her head. That, that's a symbol of just, she's just, she can't take it anymore. She's shut down. Uh, Curzon coming in is just a reminder of what the rebels did to her. The rebels uh, didn't help her when she needed help most, even though she spied on them for for uh, Curzon. And so she's really just had enough. And her shutting the door on Curzon and saying, I'm never talking to you again. I, I have my own problems now. That's the end of that chapter. Let's see what happens in chapter 26. Today we're going to read chapter 26 from Chains by Laurie House Anderson. Wednesday, August 21st to Sunday, August 25th, 1776. The storm that hit the city the next night was worse than I'd ever seen. A thundercloud, big as a mountain, swept up over the river just before sunset. Lightning danced at its edges like horses at a mad gallop. Then the sky turned ink black and the storm scratched, crashed over us. The wind blew signs off buildings, overturned soldiers' tents, and stripped the clean clothes that had been pegged out to dry. Thunder boomed like a thousand cannons. A house three blocks over was struck by lightning bolts and burned to the ground. Thirteen soldiers were killed by lightning too. The coins in their pocket melted and their flesh roasted. One lightning struck soldier survived but was turned deaf, blind, and unable to speak. We were forced to concern ourselves with more domestic matters. The window frames in the front parlor leaked terrible during the storm. Rain soaked the drapes and rugs and left the wall plaster soft and spongy. Tell the girl to clean up the mess. Becky asked around for days, but there were no spare carpenters to be found. No matter how much coin was offered, the men were all getting ready for war. The British had set up a new camp in Brooklyn on Long Island, and Washington was moving his troops around like pieces on a checkerboard. He sent most of his men across to face the British and others north to defend Fort Washington and Harlem. The front windows continued to leak. Becky began to talk of leaving to her uncle's house in Jersey. I pretended to listen to her. The streets were filled with the hurry-scurry of moving army, splashing through mud puddles, and Madame called for tea. I left to fetch for fresh water. A few bees flew out of my head as I walked north with my buckets, blown out by the strong east wind. The pain helped me too. I had cut the palm of my left hand on a dull blade at breakfast. Becky wrapped it for me, but it stung to carry even an empty bucket. Nassau Street was fair deserted all the way up to Commons. Most folks had fled, afraid to be caught between two angry armies. That's why I was surprised to see a crowd at the water pump, a dozen or so men and boys, slaves who had been hired by the army to build barricades, and a few women fetching water, like me. Beyond the men, I could see the pile of paving stones that had been pulled up for the barricade. It was midday, and the folks were gathered for a cool drink, a bite to eat, and some conversating. The talk stopped as I approached. All eyes went to my face. I had not been to the pump since my branding. I gripped the bucket tight, holding it in the pain. Most in the crowd were strangers to me. Mercy, muttered one woman as she studied my scar. Paying you much? asked another, her hair wrapped in a worn yellow cloth. It tugs some, ma'am, I said. Not as much as it did. One man spat over his shoulder and said something in a language I did not understand. The other men turned their eyes from me back to grandfather, the old man who sat by the pump, and went back to their argument. I was grateful to have the attention leave me. You're not looking at the facts, a bald man said to the grandfather. The British Lord Dunmore in Virginia offered freedom, total freedom, to any slave who escapes to his camp. He shook his fist in the air when he said freedom. Thousands have run away and joined up already. Grandfather simply nodded his head. With more behind them, I expect. A second man, this one with neatly trimmed hair, leaned on his shovel. Dunmore freed the Virginia slaves so the crops could go, would go unharvested and ruin the planters. The British care not for us. They care only for victory. Some patriots own slaves, yes, but you must listen to their words. All men created equal. The words come first. They'll pull the deeds on the justice behind them. You're a fool, the bald man said. 
He motioned to the piles of paving stones and the logs waiting to be dragged into position. We should sabotage the barricades. If the British win, we'll all be free. Shh, several people scolded. I blinked. The bees in my head fell silent and hugged their wings tight to their bodies. The British would free us? All of us? The men fell to arguing with each other, the women chiming in occasionally. Finally, the bald man raised his hand. One of us here was privy to the rebel plans, worked with one of their bosses there. Tell us, Curzon boy, what do you think of the rebel lies? At the sound of his name, Curzon stepped forward from the side of the building where he had been sitting in the shade. He looked even more changed than he had the weeks before. Well, what was different? What say you, grandfather asked? I say I'm an American, Curzon said, an American soldier. It was his clothes. When I first met him, he was dressed like the house servant of a wealthy man, which he was. Now the tailored waistcoat was gone and his shirt was dirty with sweat and mud. It hung over a pair of working man's breeches that were cut off below his knee. He did not have stockings or shoes. Even his fancy red hat was flecked with mud. The wind caught at my skirts and whirled them around my ankles. Did he say soldier? The first man laughed. You are an American slave. He untied the cloth around his neck and rinsed it in the pump water before adding in a lower voice, as we all are. Curzon shook his head, and he was still stubborn as ever, in a, if a bit worn. Not me, not for long. Master Bellingham promised me freedom for enlisting in his place. And you believe him? The man laughed louder. He's feeding you to the cannon so he can be safe. If you don't die, he'll stick your neck under his boot again. Lower your voices, Grandfather held up a shaky hand as he motioned to me. Come, child, get your water. I walked to him, and I set my buckets on the ground. The woman in the yellow head cloth worked to pump for Grandfather. The British promised freedom to slaves, but won't give it to the white rebels, she said as she pushed the handle up and down. The rebels want to take freedom. They won't share it with us. She set down the first bucket and picked up the second. Both sides say one thing and do the other. The British act on their promises, insisted the bald man. No, the man with the shovel drove it into the ground with frustration. They lie. When the British fled Boston back in the spring, they took escaping slaves with them. They promised them freedom. He stretched out the word until it sounded ugly. Where are all those slaves now? No one answered him. I'll tell you, he continued, first into Louisburg coal mines in Canada. They work and die under the ground. They never see the sun, and they'll never taste your freedom. We stood in silence at the pump handle creaked, and at last Grandfather chuckled. This is not funny, old man, said the fellow with the shovel. Young people are always funny, he said, funny and foolish. The woman in the yellow headcloth finished filling the second bucket. What do you mean, Grandfather? This is not our fight, the old man said, British or American. That is not the choice. You must choose your own side. Find your own road through the Valley of Darkness that will lead you to the River Jordan. We don't have the River Jordan, the River Jordan here, Grandfather, the bald man said as he rested the wet cloth around his neck. We have the East River with currents fast enough to kill a man and the North River two miles wide. Both are muddy, mighty hard to cross. Grandfather chuckled again. You don't understand. Everything that stands between you and freedom is the River Jordan. Come closer, child. This last, he said to me. I stepped in front of him, and he searched for my buckets, but he took my hands in his. I stopped, unsure what to do next. Look at me, he said. I bent down a little, bringing my face level with his. He tilted my chin on the side so he could examine the brand on my cheek. I tried to pull away, but he held fast. A scar is a sign of strength, he said quietly the sign of a survivor. He leaned forward and lightly kissed my cheek, right on the branding mark. His lips felt like a tired butterfly that, once, that landed once, then fluttered away. I stepped back and touched the cheek. The men were returning to the barricades. Other servants had formed a line for the pump. Grandfather winked and handed me the buckets. Look hard for your River Jordan, my child, and you'll find it. Carrying those full buckets back to the Locktons was powerful hard. The cut on my left hand pained me too much to use it, and my right hand was not big enough. My arms not strong enough to carry two buckets at once. I journeyed in a crow, in a crow hop fashion, carrying one bucket for 20 strides, setting it down, then returning to fetch the second bucket and carrying it forward to meet his partner. I made slow progress in this manner for two blocks when Curzon joined me. He would not look at me, didn't say a word neither. He simply carried the buckets to the Lockton's gate for me, and then he walked away. That was the end of chapter 26. Next, we're going to read chapter 27. Today, we're going to read chapter 27 from Chains by Laurie House Anderson. 
Monday, August 26th Saturday to Saturday, September 14th, 1776. The British thrashed the Patriots in a big battle in Brooklyn. Thrashed them, but good. They killed or captured near a thousand rebels and sent the rest scurrying away. After the worst of the battle, the skies opened up and we were all waited. Us in the house with leaking windows and a damp parlor, the soldiers in open fields and muddy ditches for the rain to stop. Madame wore a groove in the floor, pacing back and forth, awaiting for news of the final British victory, her footsteps tipping and tapping in measure with the ticking of the clock. I poked at the logs in the kitchen hearth, trying to summon back the bees so they would chase out the thoughts invading my brain pan. But the words of the bald man echoed. Would the British truly free me? Should I flee to them? And what about Ruth? Would they help me find her? The firewood was wet and green and would not catch. It smoldered and smoked and made a terrible stink. And when morning came, a thick fog smothered New York, the kind Mama called a pea super. When the fog finally lifted, the American army was not to be found. Washington's men had spent the dark night and foggy morning rowing all the troops back to New York Island, some 9,000 men, folks said. The Washington was a conjurer. That Washington was a conjurer man for sure. Madam took her to bed, took to her bed when Becky brought back the news. I muttered to a quiet blast. I muttered a quiet blast and continued to eat my dinner porridge with dried apples. Becky didn't hear me. She was going on and on about the nasty things she'd passed by at the campgrounds. And there was this one lad, oh, and he'd had his hand blown clean off and a grubby bandage wrapped around his wrist. And I looked at that and I said to myself, that arm's coming off next, young man, and maybe your leg for sure for good measure, on account of noxious pestilence that filled the air, the stench of the place, and the groans and the moans. She shivered with gruesome delight. If I had a stronger stomach, I'd take a nurse's job and help a bit with the washing of the wounds and the like. But with this heat and the flies, you just know the wounds will be maggoty by morning. And if there's one thing I can't abide is the sight of maggots in living flesh. I looked in my bowl. The dried apple bits curled like fresh hatched maggots. I stopped eating. Becky ladled at her own meal. They're all saying that this proves the Lord himself is on the, rise, on the side of the rebellion, on account of the fog he created. This is the same thing back in Boston. He blew in a thick mist so the American army would win the day, could win the day. It seemed to me that if God really wanted the Americans to win, he would have sent sea monsters to devour the fleet when it left Boston. As I went to empty my porridge into the scrap bucket, Becky pointed to her own bowl. I filled it with my leftovers and commanded my belly to stop flopping at the sight of the curly apples. Becky paused with her spoon in the air. Makes a body wonder, though. What, I asked. Washington had them melt down the church bells and remake them into cannons. That will surely displease the Lord, I said. If God switches sides and allows the British to take New York, you'll see me headed for Jersey. Back pay or no back pay, I'm not sitting here waiting to get carved into pieces by the best beastly redcoats. It took me eight days of slow trips to the market and water pump before I finally sparred Curzon, working with other men to set up a filthy, the filthy tent in the mud of the battery grounds. It was good to see him, not dead, nor chopped up. And that's the end of chapter 27. Next. Today we're going to read chapter 28, Fight from Chains, by Laurie House Anderson. Sunday, September 15, 1776. The true invasion of New York started with the firing of 100 ships' cannons when we were at church on Sunday morning. The first blast made the women shriek. The second blast made me wonder if God himself was fixing to blow the island apart. The third blast caused us to run for the door. Rebel soldiers were dashing every which direction on the street, muskets in their hands, officers bellowing loud. The horses pulling carts and carriages whinnied nervously, bobbing their heads up and down and rolling their eyes in fear of the commotion and noise. The cannons roared again. The sound was coming from the East River to, uh, side of the island to the north. I searched the skies for flaming comets, for that was how I pictured a cannonball would look. All I saw were startled birds and campfire smoke. The city itself seemed unharmed, though fear ran neck deep. Madame reached out and grabbed at the coat of an officer striding towards Battery Front Fort. He whirled, a curse on his lips, but caught himself when he realized he was speaking to a lady. Does this unholy racket mean the arrival of the war? Madame asked. Yes, ma'am, the officer said, but you need not be afraid. The generals have the matters well in hand. He hesitated as the cannons roared again. Civilians should definitely go home, lock your doors. Do not peer out of your windows. Madame contemplated him coolly. What are those men doing? She asked, pointing to the campground. The soldiers were quickly assembling their guns, ammunition, and whatever they could stuff in their sacks. They moved so fast you would have thought the ground was on fire. We're preparing to meet the enemy, he said. You're running away, she said. No, ma'am, he said as he started to move away from her. 
We're moving up to Fort Washington to guard the King's Bridge. He shouted to be heard as a wagon pulled by four horses raced by. We must follow orders. Indeed, Madam said. Becky had the Sabbath off, so I served Madam her meal of cold pork, peas, and onions cooked with sage. She was calm about finally having war at her do doorstep and thousands of riled up menfolk marching with guns. In fact, as she ate, she kept a sheet of paper, a quill, and an ink bottle by the side of the plate, and she would from time jot down a word or two. When her plate was empty, she spoke to me direct. I am preparing a list of items for you to purchase. You may leave as soon as the dishes are washed. Beg your pardon, ma'am? I need you to go down to the shops. I've no doubt Elihu will soon return home, and I'd like to celebrate with a suitable meal. It's a shame that turtles are so hard to find here. Eliel just loves turtle soup. Had she lost her mind? But the cannons, ma'am, I started. The battle, surely it will be over in a few days before. Most of the t items can be purchased at Mr. Mason's. She dipped the quill and scratched at another item. He's a thieving rat of a man, but he's loyal to the king. I know he's been hoarding his best wares. She paused as cannon fire boomed again from the north. I don't know why the rebels just don't surrender. They can't win. I froze at the sideboard. The words of the bald-headed man came to me. If the British win, we'll all be free. Could it be so simple? Might the invaders liberate me from this nightmare? What is this my chance? Madam said something, but I couldn't make out her words. Yes, ma'am, I mumbled my hands doing the work of a slave, my mind racing free. I will run and join the British. The thought washed over me like a river, sweeping away the dead bees that had filled my brain pan with confusion. The answers tumbled one after another. They would grant me freedom and give me work. I'd have to save money and make my way to Nevis and then rescue Ruth. Plain, simple, and true. Are you deaf, Madam scolded me. I'd been staring at the door and not minding her words. She took the paper in her hand. I said, take this to Mason. If he can't supply you with everything, he'll direct you where to go. I'll be going home, I thought. And you can fetch your own food and empty your own chamber pot and carry your own blasted firewood from this day forward. Girl! Madam squinted at me and tilted her head to one side. Are you feverish? I gave thanks that she could not hear my thoughts. Oh no, ma'am. I put the list in my pocket and set the last knife on the tray. I am strong as can be. I will go to Mr. Mason's directly. I paused at the parlor door. I may be delayed a wee bit, ma'am, I said with care. What with the commotion and all? A dozen or so soldiers dashed down the middle of the street, their boots thudding. It can't be helped, Madam said with a sigh. Walking down Broadway, I was a fish swimming in the wrong direction. Everyone else in New York flowed north and fought against my progress. Continental troops in ragged formation, militia units carrying packs and haversacks, small artillery pieces pulled by horses, and carts weighed down with women and children. The noise was deafening, along with the shouts of men and women. Every dog in the city was barking alarm. Pigs squealed underfoot, and occasionally a musket would fire, which led to, a th sounded, which led to shouted oaths and yelps. Drums beat and fifes flew, and beneath everything was the steady clockwork, blast of the British cannons firing at the troops stationed north of us. I kept to the front of the buildings, ducking into doorways when necessary, until I finally took refuge in an abandoned chandler's shop. The door was unlocked, sorry, the door was locked, but the front windows had been smashed to bits when the owner was tarred and feathered some previous weeks before. I crawled through the window, taking care not to cut myself on the glass chars jut jutting out of the frame. I set my basket on the floor, and Ruth's doll rested inside it under a rag. That was the one thing I could not leave behind. The shop smelled musty and damp, and the shelves stood empty. All the candles and other goods were stolen the day they ran the Chandler out of town. It was a gloomy place, but would serve well as a temporary shelter. I stood by the window, and I watched the tide of people roll out of the city. Hurry, I ur silently urged them. Hurry, I also urged the British Army. I did not want them to land right away, not until the last of the crowd had left, but it would be nice if they arrived right quick after that, before Madame could hire someone to seek me out. Finally, the crowd thinned and cartwheels could be heard echoing on the road. I waited a little longer just to be sure. A few Continentals dashed, their hands holding their hats on their heads, canteens, cartridges, cases banging against their backsides. They were followed by a rough-looking militia unit that was trailed by a group of slaves carrying shovels and pickaxes. I searched for that familiar red hat, but I did not find it. When the air fell still, with just a few voices calling orders in the distance, I hiked up my skirts and I crawled out through the window. So in this chapter, lots is happening right now. The British are attacking, so Isabel really sees this as her chance with all the commotion to escape, basically, from Mrs. Lockton. She's really holding true to that, the information she found at the water pump that maybe the British would free them. So she's thinking that maybe if she 
if they win, then she's going to get her freedom. She'll find Ruth and she can have a life of her own. We'll see what happens in chapter 29. Hi, today we're going to read chapter 29 from Chains by Laurie House Anderson. Sunday, September 15th, 1776. I was the only person on the street. The army was gone and the city abandoned. I shivered, though the day was still warm. Had I made a mistake? Should I run after the rebels and join them? Should I go back to the Locktons? A cannon boomed to the north. No, I chose the right course. At least I hoped I had. I headed to the waterfront. Several of the grand mansions of Lower Broadway stood with their doors ajar. A fire burned at the edge of the street, heaped with books and scads of paper. The smoke rose up into the air, drifting towards the masts of a few ships at anchor. Cannons boomed again. What if they didn't arrive right away? How long did I have to wait before Madame grew suspicious? A gust of wind blew and carried with it its first hint of fall. Canoe-shaped chestnut leaves turned yellow round the edges. The leaves caught and piled up against the soldiers' tents left behind at Battery Campground. I walked over and I pulled the flap of a tent and inside led two bedrolls, a pipe and tobacco pouch, and a shirt dropped in the middle of mending. The needles were still threaded and stuck to the fabric. I closed the flap. They left near everything, tents, blankets, extra clothing, cook pots, and food. It would be a cold night for Curzon and his companions. Voices came from the waterfront, military voices shouting orders. I hurried away from the barracks, dashed down Water Street, and hid behind a rain barrel at the corner of the joiner's workshop. A half dozen flat bottom boats were being rowed to the docks. Two were already tied up and tall soldiers wearing red uniforms of King George were striding down the street. Lobsterbacks, lobster backs, folks called them. They fanned out across the waterfront, their muskets primed and held at a ready position. And as I watched, a third boat floated to the wharf. The soldiers on it jumped out and marched in formation to the battery in search of the rebel soldiers. A woman carrying a baby fled, screaming loudly. A few of the redcoats chuckled and stabbed at the air with their bayonets. My throat went dry. As the fourth, fourth boat landed, an officer stepped off and barked a, com a command at the laughing men. They lined up and stood attention. The officer gave another command and the mar men marched on, splitting into three groups to investigate the battery and the waterfront buildings. The officer stood alone at the foot of the dock, surveying the deserted town as more boats splashed towards the landing spot. This was my chance. I forced myself out of my hiding place and I walked towards him, my back ramrod straight. I beg your pardon, I said boldly. What is it, girl, he asked. Before I could answer, a soldier dashed up to him. Captain Campbell, sir, the campground appears deserted. The rebels left behind their tents and bedrolls. Secure the tent flaps, open and check every one. It could be a trap. Yes, sir, came the crisp reply before the man ran off. I prayed I would not faint from fear and tried again for the captain's attention. I can cook, sir. I can wash, sew, even doctor the sick a little. Don't bother me, child. I trailed after him as he walked towards the campground. Please, sir, I insisted. I'm all kinds of useful. I can chop wood, I can carry water or messages. I was interrupted by another soldier who approaches us and saluted. Report, Captain Campbell said. The spies were correct, sir. The rebels have retreated. The battery is empty of men, but filled with the positions and weapons they left behind, including several cannons. They even left a tea kettle bubbling over the fire. Civilians in the first three streets north of here all attest to their haste. Putnam's unit was the last to one out. They're on their way up the island by the way of Greenwich Road. Do we pursue, sir? The captain fought the smile that played in the corner of his lips. Our task is to occupy the city. We'll let the Highlanders hunt them down. Tell the men to take over the barracks and prepare Washington's headquarters for Major General Robertson. Yes, sir, the soldier saluted again and did not move. What is it now, Jennings, said the captain. Begging pardon, sir, but I've been informed as the whereabouts of Washington's headquarters is if I was to be given that information, I could pursue my obligations with greater speed. I don't know where it is, Captain Campbell said with an irritation. Use your noggin, man. Ask the tavern keeper. You want the Kennedy Mansion, sir, I said, just beyond the end of the battery facing the Bowling Green. What did you say? The captain fired at me. My knees were shaking under my skirt. The Kennedy Mansion, sir, that was General Washington's main headquarters, number one Broadway. His wife stayed at the Mort Mortier House, but he kept headquarters straight that away. I pointed west. And more officers in the city hall. I pointed north, up Broad Street. Ooh, very good, he said. There you have it, Sergeant, proceed. The sergeant yelled to his unit as he walked away from us. The waterfront was awash in red. Now as boatloads of soldiers disembarked, Shouted orders filled the air, along with nervous laughter and the sound of British boots on the cobblestones. A few more boats were on their way, with their first boats headed back for more. 
The occupation was well and truly begun. You're correct, young miss. You are useful. But we don't want troublemakers in the camp. What's the meaning of the mark on your face? I touched the raised scar and decided that honesty was my old, only recourse. This stands for insolence, sir. When my mistress sold my little sister, I tried to run away. She's five years old. My sister, not my mistress. He blinked and cleared his throat. Regrettable and understandable. I have a younger sister myself. Your mistress, am I to assume she supports the rebel cause? No, sir. Our house is Tory. My master was driven out of the town by the Patriot leader. My mistress is much cheered by your arrival. She wants to hire a proper staff so she can entertain again. She'll not miss my services one bit. The words tumbled out before I measured them. The captain's mouth hardened, and I knew I had stepped wrong. He tugged at his sash. I cannot accept your services, child. We only employ slaves run away from rebel owners. I did not hear him right. Pardon me? Gentlemen, docking, sir cried a soldier on the wharf. Captain Campbell turned at the men, tossed thick ropes from the dock of the occupants to the next boat. It contained only four soldiers, each manning, manning an oar. The rest of the passengers were men dressed in expensive civilian clothes. When they're ashore, ask them to escort them to the tavern for a celebration, the captain said loudly. Issue the tavern keeper an officer a forged certificate. Warn him, sergeant. He is not to ask gentlemen for payment unless he wants to spend the night in the irons. They are our guests. Yes, sir, came the enthusiastic response. As we had been talking, ordinary city folk had begun to creep out of their houses. Now there was a full crowd gathered. The Tories of New York, who had been awaiting the day for months, years, cheered. Cheers were heard in the distance. The arriving soldiers were greeted by townsmen who shook their hands and patted them heartily on the back. I recognized a few faces, the Reverend and his wife, and a few people who had called at the Lockton's home. Captain Campbell bent towards me and he spoke quickly and quietly. I do not hold with slavery, but I can't help you. We do not interfere with loyalist property. Return to your mistress. So at this point, she really has lost hope. She, she really thought that she would be able to go work for the British, but the British won't hire her because she is actually owned by a British family and he can't do that. So again, her hopes are dashed because she, can't, she just can't be owned by them at this point. So here we go, we continue. A loud huzzah from hundreds of throats came from the battery as the American flag was pulled down. A drummer started beating time and the Union Jack rose up to the top of the flagpole, accompanied by whistles and shouts from the lobsterbacks and loyalists, New Yorkers, who took off their hats in respect. A woman in the crowd snatched the American flag out of the hands of the British soldiers and stomped on it under her boots. The men laughed. So now we see that the American, the rebels have retreated and the British are taking over New York, which is what the loyalists who had been hiding are actually into, were waiting for. So now they're all coming out. It's a big party. They're really excited to see the British soldiers arrive. The rat-a-tattering of, of drumsticks rattled through me, setting my teeth to shaking and, walking, and walking, waking the bees who had lately gone to sleep in my brain pan. He couldn't take me. He would not. It was chained between two nations. I was chained between two nations. The bees swarmed again behind my eyes, making the scene grow dim and distant. The sun was nearing the horizon, casting long shadows across the wharf. I was a ghost tied to the ground, not a living soul. All ashore, sir, called the soldier, trying to up, tying up the last boat. All ashore, corporal. The captain acknowledged. I want patrols assembled immediately to keep watch on the streets and sentry fires built on every corner. Yes, sir. The gentleman who had arrived in the boat walked towards us, talking with great excitement. One of them was painfully familiar, and he called to me before I could flee. Sal? called Master Elihu Lockton, thinner from his exile, eyes bloodshot and wary. Is that you? I dropped into a curtsy and dared not say a word. He studied me with one suspicion. What are you doing here? Sergeant Jennings approached. The tavern is open if the gentleman would like to take drink to victory. Lockton waved to his companion. I shall join you shortly. As the gentleman hurried to the tavern, his eyes traveled from my head down to my shoes and back. What news, Sal? he asked. How do you come to be here? I pulled Madam's list from my pocket and prayed he would not look inside my basket. Come to market, sir, I whispered. Ah, what is this? He shook my chin. He took my chin in his fingers, turning it so that the last rays of the sunset fell on my scar. Is the eye for illustrious or perhaps impertinent? My face burned both in the scar and where his lavender smelling fingers pinched my skin. The bees flew through me and told me to grab Campbell's sword and run it through Lockton's belly. And then what? And then what? I suspect it stands for insolence, Captain Campbell said calmly. Tis a common brand among the people of Boston. Lockton laughed at the small joke and released me. Now we're calling her insolent Sal, a very saucy gal. 
The captain smiled and put his hand on the hilt of his sword. I should have known she was attached to your household, sir. She greeted me with the name of the king and thanked me for rescuing the city from the rebels. They both looked at me. We prayed for liberation, I said. Even our slaves have become political, Lockton said. How quaint. Do you wish to accompany your servant home to greet your mistress? The captain asked. Lockton shook his head. Ah, not at the moment. Go home, Sal. Tell Anna she'll be along after I've lifted a few glasses in celebration. The two men headed for the tavern and the sun finally dropped out of sight. I must have gone to Mason's and bought the items on Madame's list, though I remember it not. My body moved through the streets, past sentry fires and redcoats carrying torches down suspicious alleys and into abandoned houses. Around me was the sound of victors celebrating and the smell of meat they roasted for their supper. Around me, all was darkness. So Mr. Lockton is back. He's, he's come back with the British and now he's going to be heading home. When he sees Sal there, she knows she, or Sal, Isabel, she knows that she doesn't have any choice, but she has to go back. She has to go back to the house and she has to keep fighting, but she knows how strong she is now. She's getting stronger every day again and she will find her freedom eventually, we hope. Let's read chapter 30 next.